of course. You have been previously uh, kind of critical of intermittent fasting, low carb approaches, um, protocols for women. And I'm curious, you know, for someone listening to this now, um, the person is, I guess, 20 years old, 20 to 30 years old, and they've been waking up in the morning. They've been going to the gym on a black cup of coffee. Um, I'm curious, could you perhaps talk us through why that may not be the most optimal strategy, even if she's waking up and going to the gym at the same time as her boyfriend and they're doing kind of similar kind of workouts? Because I feel this is a very, very important point. And it's a very common scenario, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, there are a couple of layers here. I first like to explain the circadian rhythm aspect of it. So men and women's circadian rhythms are different. We see that with even melatonin peak at night. So women's melatonin peak happens between 9 and 9.30 at night. Men's is about an hour later. So this is why women are like, oh, I'm really tired. And their partner's like, oh, I'm not. I want to stay up and watch TV. Yeah. So there's this circadian rhythm conversation that we have to have. So if we're looking at that circadian rhythm, if a woman gets up and she has a black coffee and she goes to the gym and she's training fasted, she's effectively phase shifting her circadian rhythm. So we're going to see this phase shift where that melatonin peak is going to be blunted and she's not going to get that melatonin peak until later, which means that it is interrupting all the normal pulses that happen with our hormones throughout the day. And I'm not just talking appetite hormones. I'm also talking about our luteinizing hormone pulse, our estrogen, progesterone after ovulation, like all of these work on a cellular pulse and feedback. We can see changes in hormone concentration over the course of 90 minutes. Most people think it's a linear, oh, I'm on day four of my menstrual cycle. So it's like this linear thing, but it's not, it pulses throughout the day. So for phase shifting in our circadian rhythm, we're altering that hormone pulse, which is an additional stress. So the way that the body perceives stress is it increases inflammation. We know that we are already in an inflammatory state just by the nature of Western society with our external stresses and the quality of the food and the misstep that so many people have in their circadian rhythm. For someone who's in their 20s, I know fertility isn't necessarily at the forefront of their brain, but it might be, right? And I was uh, able to sit down with Dr. Natalie Crawford, and we had this long conversation about fasting and inflammation. And one of the big drivers of infertility is inflammation. So if we look at how fasting can drive that inflammation, unless you have PCOS, so fasting drives that inflammation, we see the shift in our circadian rhythm. And then we have hypothalamic changes. So that's the area in the brain that's very sensitive to nutrient density and the way that our hormones are working throughout the day. If we wake up, have a black coffee, go training, we are, again, misstep with our cortisol peak because we're now driving cortisol up even more with that caffeine. And with that drive up is a drive of our acylated ghrelin, which is our active form of our hunger hormone. And if we don't take care of it by having some food, the hypothalamus is being stimulated by some other neuropeptides that we're in a, a flight or fight situation without fuel. And so it's like, okay, now I need to start conserving. So what do I do? I start downregulating things and I start breaking down lean mass. So when women are getting up, having black coffee, going to the gym, doing training, they're putting themselves in a catabolic state, which one, drives inflammation, two, drives cortisol up, three, interferes with our hormone pulses, and four, reduces the ability to put on lean mass and bone. If we were just to have a little bit of food, maybe protein coffee or protein matcha before you go to the gym, then all of that dissipates because now we're not phase shifting. We're not interfering with our hormone pulses. We're not signaling to the brain that we need to break down our lean mass. It doesn't take a lot, but it is just one small step that has so many ramifications that we can correct and then start to see progression and benefit for our training and get better sleep. If we get better sleep, then we have a better metabolic control. We have better ability to change body composition and we drop inflammation. If you were to, I guess, design the perfect pre, perhaps during, um, kind of post-training 
um, kind of fueling protocol for women. Um, how, I guess, would that kind of differ to, you know, as you mentioned, obviously, there's a very common scenario in which a lot of people, they're waking up, they're having a black coffee, going to the gym. What what kind of would the, the optimal strategy that you're thinking about be but there for fueling? So I always look at the 5 a.m. club, right? Because I have a lot of friends, myself sometimes included, in the 5 a.m. club. And it's not very fun to get up that early and get to the gym. You're not really hungry. So I try to scope it that way. So if we're looking at someone who has to get out the door and get to the gym and be ready to go by like 5, you don't really want to get up super early and have a meal. So this is where things like the protein coffee comes into play where you're making a uh, cold brew and putting um, protein powder and, and milk or almond milk, whatever, in the night before. So you can drink that as you're going. You could have a small water-based or kefir-based smoothie as well. So we're looking at maybe 15 to 20 grams of protein before you go with a little carbohydrate. If you're really in a pinch, you could have, uh, you know, a quarter cup of, of low-fat or non-fat Greek yogurt with some honey. So you're eating some carb and some protein. After training, if you're going to the gym and you're there for a Metcon or a High Rocks mix or, you know, or just strength training, you're there for an hour, hour and a half, you can have your real breakfast when you get back. So that could be overnight oats, that could be um, eggs on toast, whatever your real breakfast is. It doesn't have to be that difficult. Um, and so that would set you up really well for the rest of the day. If you're someone who's like, I get up early, I have some meetings, then I get people out the door and then I go training at like nine o'clock instead of five o'clock. It's like, let's get up, let's have a mini meal. So maybe it's half your breakfast. And then that's about an hour and a half before you go to the gym or go for your run. And then when you come back, you have the other half of your breakfast. So it doesn't have to be a lot of extra thought. It's just putting that play into nutrient timing so that you aren't going and trying to do all of this stressful work on an empty tank, so to, so to speak. 